Grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 12 this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 12. That morning tea worked out, right? If the weather's nice, it's actually quite pleasant out there. That's good. Um, kind of nice being in a different spot to congregate. And it kind of takes the pressure off the back as well, all the um, crowd back there. So I thought that was pretty good. All right. And thanks to all those that have been calling this week with different ideas. And we appreciate that. We can use all the ideas and help we can get at this time. All right. First Samuel chapter 12, I'll read the entire chapter. We're going through this uh, book together, this series, and I uh, hope that you're getting as much out of it as I am. This has been really good. First Samuel 12 now. So Saul, the new king, has been anointed, and then the last passage we looked at last week was where it was announced and uh, the people um, got what they asked for. They got Saul the king. This is now Samuel's final address to them, although we'll keep on seeing Samuel um, for a while after this. This is his final address to, uh, to the people because, of course, Samuel, in a way, is like prophet, priest, and king. He's been the leader, but now Saul is uh, the leader, of course. Verse 1. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice and all that you have said to me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am, testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. They said, You have not defrauded us, or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and is anointed as witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, He is witness. And Samuel said to the people, The Lord is witness. Who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt? Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt... And the Egyptians oppressed them. Then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord, their God. And he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubal and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side. And you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Now behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commands of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the, the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commander, commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. 
And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid, for you have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with, your, with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray now as we look at your word, we ask for your help. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us not to be distracted, clear our minds of anything that would prevent us from paying close attention to what you would have us to see this morning. And please, would your spirit teach us and convict us and point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may know him more and trust him more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I heard again this week this thing that people say about sermons and about speeches and so on. They say that people really only, not you guys, but lots of people only listen to the first thing and the last thing that the speaker says. So let me give the important stuff right now. The good news, listen, the good news of Christianity is really good news if we turn from going our own way and trust in Jesus, his death in our place, that all of our sins can be forgiven, and we can relate to God as our Heavenly Father if we turn to Him in faith. I'm telling you the important information right now. I, I think if we're honest, if we really are honest, we would admit, though, that we don't live as we should, and we don't do unto others as we would have them do to us, and we admit that we don't even live up to our own standards, let alone God's standards. And it's common, even sitting here among God's people, singing the hymns, praying the prayers, listening to the scripture, and so on, for people to feel quite burdened by an awareness of their own sin, their own failings, their own rebellion before God. And it's common, um, you know, we can, we can picture Pilgrim, Pilgrim's progress as he starts off on his journey. He's got that big burden on his back, doesn't he? As he approaches and then he gets to the cross, he gets to Christ and the burden rolls off his back. And there may be people here today who can really relate to that. They say, I've got this burden of sin and guilt on my back and I can't get rid of it. It's things I've done wrong. It's things I haven't done that I should have done. It's things I've said that I, that I wish I could take back and I've got this burden. And it's because they haven't applied the gospel to their guilt, to their burden. And in some cases, they've been carrying that burden around for years and years. So again, there may be some sitting here this morning who never really approached God through the Lord Jesus Christ and repented of their sin and trusted in Jesus. And the good news is that on the, the cross, Jesus says to us the best possible thing that anybody could ever say to you when you're carrying a burden like that. He says, let me take that for you. Let me take that for you. And Peter writes, he, Christ, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He bore our sins on his body on the tree. And for those of us who turn to him, he takes our sins, he takes our offenses, whatever we've done or left undone, and all those sins are punished once and for all on the cross so that we might know forgiveness and be right with God. That's really, really good news, right? That's how I'm starting. That's the good news. Pay attention to that. Repent, trust in Christ. If that's new news to you this morning, new news, I encourage you to talk to somebody. If you've never really understood what Christianity is about, that it's not about you doing, 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 but it's all about what Christ has done for you, 
then you need to talk to somebody and we would love to help you and encourage you and, and give you some resources as you make that journey. But here's the question I want to focus on this morning. How are Christians to see their sin? For most of us here, we are followers of Christ. We have received God's forgiveness. How are we to think about that ongoing sin in our lives? Because you've all sinned this week. You may have sinned this morning. Um, how are we to think about that? How are we to deal with that ongoing sin in our lives as followers of Christ? There are a couple of wrong ways that we might think of following. Don't do this. But some people think, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. That's a wrong way. I, I should just ignore it. It doesn't matter because I, I'm forgiven and, and uh, it's not really an issue. That's a wrong way of thinking about our sin. The other way is to think, well, it, it matters so much. It paralyzes me. I've never really applied that forgiveness to myself. And, and I, I might fall into thinking, well, um, I might lose my salvation. Um, I might lose God's forgiveness because of something I've done now as a Christian. And that he might reject me because of my sin. So I, I want to address both of those things this morning as we look at this passage. Here's the context. You remember that uh, Israel has this new beginning now. Uh, Israel has, has got a new king, King Saul. He's the first king. They've asked for this king, and God's given it. And by the work of Saul, um, God's spirit through Saul, I should say, God's just led them this great victory over this Ammonite king. His name was Nahor. Um, and, and so this great ceremony takes place at Gilgal. Gilgal is always the place of new beginnings. Gilgal is the place they went to first after they crossed the Jordan with Joshua, Gilgal. So they come to this place called Gilgal, and they make sacrifices to the Lord, and they hold this great celebration. It's wonderful. They're thinking, we have a king. We have relief from our enemies, the Ammonites, the Philistines. It's a fresh start. But Samuel won't let that go to their heads. Now, he wants them to keep their feet on the ground, and he knows there's an issue between them and the Lord. The problem is they've never really understood their relationship with God and their sin. They've never even admitted their sin before God with this asking for a king. So Samuel addresses them so that they might see themselves rightly and see the Lord rightly, and he sets out the terms of that relationship. And I want you to see here that Samuel's message to them is also very helpful for us as God's people as we consider our own sin, even as followers of Christ. So first thing I want you to see is our sin is serious. If you have the notes in the bulletin, you can fill that in. Our sin is serious. There's a key turning point here in verses 18 and 19 when the people have this change of attitude, right? And in verses 18 and 19, they stand, Israel stands in awe of the Lord, and they acknowledge their sin before God. And it's a really significant moment. Um, and this whole passage, Samuel's whole speech, is driving towards that point. That's the point he wants to get them to. And so he has this address. He devotes his speech uh, to convincing the Israelites of their sin before God as they ask him for a king. And so it's really important as we, as we see this, that um, you know, in our own lives, if we have a, a problem with sin in our lives right now, that will always be an issue until you go before the Lord and address that and admit it. So they've, they've noticeably failed to acknowledge their sin up to this point. If you go back to chapter 8, just glance at it. Chapter 8 is where they made their request for a king. And when they do so, Samuel desperately turns to God, and the Lord tells him to warn the Israelites of what will happen if they reject God and if they go after this king because they want to be like the other nations. And you might remember the, the word that appears again and again and again in chapter 8 as he describes this. Samuel says, he will take, take, take. This king, if you get what you're asking for, if you get this king... He will take, take, take. He will take many of the good things that you, that you have, your king. He will oppress you. You'll even cry out for God for relief. And Samuel says, the Lord will not answer you on that day. Look at verse 19 of chapter 8. 
the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may be like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They are a stubborn, rebellious people. And there's been no acknowledgement of their sin. And we saw last time how Saul, their new king, was revealed to them. And Samuel, again, he reminds them of how they had rejected God by asking for a new ruler. And we saw last week, he reminds them all about their wickedness. He goes back through their history, all their rebellion. And then, after all that, he gives them their king, this man who's hiding in the baggage. Remember this? Saul is hiding in the baggage. This man whose only qualification for leadership is his unusual height. This is the king that you have asked for, says Samuel. And the people reply, long live the king. We've got what we asked for. And they will not acknowledge that what they've done is wrong. Now we look at them and we despair at their wickedness. And we say, oh, those Israelites, they're so blind. But they should remind us of us. They should remind us of us. It's fairly standard human traits that we... You know, that we don't acknowledge the things that we've done wrong. We just ignore our sins. We think if there's enough time, you know, people will forget about what we've done. God won't worry about it if there's enough time. Oh, it may be forgotten. Or we go into total denial. I really didn't do it. Or it wasn't me. One of the first phrases that uh, children get the hang of is, I didn't. I didn't. Eleanor's not there yet. She will. She'll get there. It's a human trait. And then it becomes... It wasn't me. <laughs> one of our kids, I should get paying my kids if I give, give these illustrations. One of our kids, we could always tell when this particular child was about to tell a lie, because he would, oh, <laughs> I've, I've narrowed it down. We'd say, did you do this? And this child would say, well, <laughs> and we always knew that that's the start of a story and he wasn't really going to tell the truth. I watch that Highway Patrol show. Do you ever watch this? It's, I now watch YouTube videos like this as well. We have all kinds of choice to watch people doing the wrong thing. And here you'll see it in high definition. They're not wearing their seatbelt or they're speeding or they're talking on their phone. High definition. We see it and they get pulled over and they deny it. Oh, it wasn't me. I was just itching my ear or, or, or whatever. Not me. And we are just like rebellious children. It's just that we get more sophisticated with our denials. We don't like to admit that we've done wrong. Well, Israel fails to see and admit their offense. And Samuel, in this chapter, chapter 12, puts the case to them. I want you to see this as Samuel just laying it out like a courtroom before them, putting that case to them. Here's, here's what he does. He, he starts gently in verses 1 through 5 defending himself. Did you notice that? He defends himself. He holds up his own leadership to them, and he shows them that he's never harmed or exploited them in any way. He says, go on, tell me what I have done wrong. Verse 3, here I am, testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Who have I defrauded? And he goes on, you might say, well, why is Samuel doing that? Why does he have to defend himself in that way? Uh, he's not the real issue. God is. Ah, but their rejection of Samuel is a rejection of God. And we saw that back in chapter 8. The Lord provided Samuel as their leader, and, and they had all they needed through, through him. At some point, if you have the time, look at chapter 7, which we've done before. But it's a real high point in Samuel's ministry. And, and God leads him in victory over the Philistines, their great enemies. And Samuel fulfills this, this role of prophet and priest and king before them. Samuel had been God's provision for Israel for all these years. And he makes clear here, he's never done anything wrong. He, he's never oppressed them. He's never taken anything from them. God's been so good in providing Samuel for them. But now, they wanted a king. So they could be like everyone else. A king who, unlike Samuel, would take, take, take. So in rejecting Samuel, they had rejected God. 
Next, he focuses on their spiritual amnesia. You know what I mean? They, they're forgetful. They're like us again. They had forgotten how the Lord had rescued them again and again. So he gives them this little history lesson. So verse 8, he reminds them of the Lord's track record. First, Egypt. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. That verse very neatly summarizes the book of Exodus, what takes place there. That, that story that really defines the Israelites, God saving them from the Egyptians, is the, the, this rescue story, and he brings them into the promised land. But what did they do? They forget this stuff. They for, Like us, they forget what God had done. Verse 9, so God sold them into the hands of Sisera. And now he goes on to summarize the book of Judges, verses 9 through 11. Uh, the book of Judges is all about, again, God's goodness to them. How time and time again, they would leave the Lord, go after false gods and idolatry and all those different sinful things. And then God would lead the enemies in to oppress them and they would cry out to God. Sometimes they wouldn't even cry out, but God would send a deliverer, a, a savior. It, they had this persistent idolatry. Notice the last, the last judge who's listed there, verse 11. It's Samuel. So he's saying that from the earliest days of the nation, they didn't deserve any of this from Exodus through to Judges, right up to the present time, the Lord had faithfully, faithfully delivered them from all their enemies. And he says, you know that. You know what God has done. You, you know how he, he's so faithful, your history testifies to it. And then verse 12, this is last week's passage, verse 12. And when you saw that Nahash, Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us. And when the Lord your God was your king. So we only just heard of Nahash last week, but it seems he's been an ongoing problem, a persistent problem there. And Samuel is saying, you know what God has done. And you've forgotten all those great victories. And then the next problem comes, Nahash. And it's like, you know, you didn't remember. You didn't turn to the Lord again, the one who's promised to save you. I wonder if there's a challenge there for us. Because we can be like this. Um, Sam and Jordan gave me a, a journal for Christmas. And I need to start using it just for the fact that I'm like that. You know, God does a great victory. It might be a conflict in my life, it might be a you know, hardship or something going on, and we pray about it, and God delivers, and God does something very blessed, and you forget. And then the next thing comes along, and you're like, oh, what will I do? And you forget what God's done for you in the past. Is there a challenge there for us? We can speak of great enthusiasm about God's goodness to us, his mercy, most of all his mercy in saving us. But then the crunch comes and we say, well, will I trust him today? What will we do when that latest threat emerges? You know, there'll be something bigger than COVID in your life probably. What will we do when that next thing comes? Will we trust in him? Or how about when God's word tells us something that we struggle with, that we don't understand? We say, well, I don't know. will we trust him and follow him? believing that just as he did in the past, he will now help us and save us. Well, Israel doesn't trust him. They want their own solution. They want this latest thing, which is a king, and they've rejected God. But as Samuel says in verses 13 through 15, regardless of whether or not they have a king, the issue is, will they be faithful to God? Will they obey him? If they and their king follow the Lord, good. But if they don't, there will, be, there will be trouble. Now, Samuel's case is almost complete. In asking for a king, they rejected God's provision in Samuel. They have forgotten God's faithfulness to them in the past. But it seems that if Israel's really going to get it, they need to have a visible demonstration of God's greatness. So verses 16 and 17. Now therefore stand still, and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. That always reminds me of Charlton Heston, you know, that, that scene in Ten Commandments. 
Stand and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? Isn't that the time of the year? Isn't that what the, the weather should be like? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. This is unusual. And you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So it's the dry season. It's, it's now time to harvest in the, the, the grain and so on. And Samuel calls for thunder and rain. It's unexpected. It's miraculous in that way. He's calling upon it from God. And God does it. And the Lord sends thunder and rain. And the people are awestruck. And at last, at last, with that latest thing, they cry out for mercy and acknowledge finally the evil of what they've done. The seriousness of sin. Do we, do we see it? The preacher stands up here every week, talks about sin. Do you see the seriousness of your sin and your pride? Do we see how when we ignore God's word and go our own way, like Israel, we're not trusting in God's goodness and in his provision for us. We're not remembering how good he's been to us in the past. And when we look back at the cross, we can't say anything else other than he's been really, really good for us and to us. Now, we can be like them. We can call, cry out for a sign too. Lord, show me how great you are. But we can do that every Sunday as we think about the Lord's Supper. Anytime, actually, as we think about the cross. Isn't he awesome that all of our sins are laid on him for us and Jesus, God's son, dies for us. God says our sin is serious. Not only does it wreck this world, but it ruins our relationship with God. It offends him. That's the biggest thing. Our sin offends God. We might say, well, Israel had a good thing here. They, they saw the thunder and the lightning and, and all that. God performed this sign. What about us? God has given us a sign. And I think it's the cross where we see how, how graciously he deals with us and how, how offensive our sin is before him that God's son has to die, take on God's righteous anger for us. And therefore, it's good and right for us to see that and to keep seeing that and to acknowledge our sin before him. You know, some churches have an actual time in their service where they have a prayer of confession. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing as you say your prayers personally to have a time of confession. We say A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, right? Confession is really important. Lord, I've messed up today. I've messed up this week. I confess my sins. This is serious. I don't want my relationship to be hurt because of this. You do it in your other relationships. You need to do it with the Lord. And when you pray, that's a good habit to get into. John says, I, I should have read this earlier. John says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So sin is serious. Second point, God's grace is greater. God's grace is greater. We sing that song, his mercy is more. I love that. God's grace is greater. It's a wonderful message. And it's a whole Bible message that, yes, our sin is serious, but God's grace is more. It's greater. It's brilliant. God's undeserved, generous, overflowing mercy is greater than our rebellion. That's good news. So verse 20, here's the sum up. Verse 20, Samuel says to the people, do not be afraid. Because they're trembling. They, they see the thunder and lightning. They finally realize their sin, their, 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 their rebellion before God. And here's the message. Do not be afraid. They confess their sin. Do not be afraid. In the Bible, time and time again, when the people are confronted with God's holiness, how often do you hear that message? Do not be afraid. Fear not. And it's wonderful that if we are convicted by our sin and we throw ourselves at God's mercy, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And as Israel finally acknowledges her great offense and cries out for help, Samuel says, do not be afraid. 
You have done all this evil. He's not going to sweep under the mat. Yes, you've done this. You confess your sin. Yes, own it. You have done this great evil. He doesn't say it doesn't matter, but he does tell them what they can do, which is turn to God and find solace and refuge in him by his grace. So verse 20. Verse 20, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And what that means is in the next verse, verse 21, don't turn to useless idols. Now Israel did have a history of adopting the idol worship of the land, the Baals, the Ashtaroth, all those things. But actually their idolatry is much broader than that. Idols are, are simply putting something else in God's place. It's a counterfeit God, as Tim Keller says, a counterfeit God putting something else in God's place and seeking help from that thing where you should be seeking help from God. And we can do that with all kinds of things. Yeah, you can do it with physical things. The more common with us is maybe mental or emotional or, or spiritual things that we turn to instead of God. Here, it's the desire for a human leader when they're not turning to God, right? For us, it might be the prizes of this world. It might be the basic desire to be the one who's in control of our lives, to be number one. I think this last two years, God's destroying that. You're not in control of your life. You're fooling yourself if you think you are. But Samuel says, whatever it is that you put in God's place, don't turn to those things. Why? Because they're useless. <laughs> they're useless. Literally, it's nothings. They're nothings. And if you put something useless, if you put a nothing at the center of your life, it won't do you any good. You know, we laugh at horoscopes because they're useless. They, they do not turn to a horoscope to find the guidance for your life because it doesn't. It's useless. And it won't save you. Or whatever else that you're putting in front of God, it won't, it can't, because it's nothing. It's not real. So a Facebook message yesterday, somebody in Clarkson asking for a good medium, a good spiritual medium to help this person, and I couldn't help it. I said, do not do that. I said, if that stuff, it's all fake. I, I, I said, if it's real, if there's some reality to it, it's satanic. It's sat I said that, it's satanic. I said, find your meaning or your help from the true one who knows all things, and that's the Lord. And, I don't know. I got a few thumbs up. But. <laughs> don't turn to idols. They're nothing. They're nothing. And Samuel, or Saul, he's going to have a problem with that later on in his life, isn't he? Instead, Samuel says, trust in God's mercy. Trust in his mercy. You might ask why. Why should we trust in God's mercy? Why should Israel believe that God will be merciful to them rather than rejecting them after all this? And starting again. Why doesn't he do that? Just... Start afresh with another nation altogether. Do you ever wonder that yourself? Here I am again, Lord. Why do you just reject me altogether? Why won't you start again? Verse 22. This is, this is gold. He says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you uh, a people for himself. The reason that the Lord won't reject Israel is because God has tied his reputation, his glory to Israel. And he continues to, to, to keep his reputation attached to them. That's why he won't reject them. It's, it's like, imagine this, a wealthy Elon Musk type that buys a sports team or a football team or whatever it might be. He says, I'm going to take this team to the top. They are going to be champions in the land because I've, you know, I've, I've laid all my wealth on them and, and they're going to bring great glory to me and great wealth to me and honor. And everyone will recognize what I've done. And maybe the first year they do quite well. They get all this money and wealth poured into them. But in the second season, the team starts to lose. And there's lots of infighting and they take it out on the management what does the owner do? I don't think he will ditch the team altogether because he's already said, I've pinned my reputation on them and I will stay committed. This is my investment. I will not fail. Well, it could happen, I suppose, but perfectly the Lord. Why would the Lord ditch us? 
infinitely more because he has tied his reputation to them, his glory. He is pleased to make his people his own. He won't reject Israel because he's staked his name, his reputation on her. And I think that's a great encouragement to us as God's people. As we face up to our sin and battle with sin, the Lord's tied his reputation, his glory to us. He's committed himself to us. It's bound up with who he is. And therefore, we know that he will keep us. If there's one thing we can be absolutely sure of, it's that God's committed to the honor of his name, to his own glory. And it doesn't mean that we can be complacent. I'm not saying that. It doesn't mean that we can say, well, my sin's not serious. No, no. Look at verse 25. Here's a warning. Verse 25 is a warning that, that God's commitment to his people could, and in fact would be maintained, even if through a small remnant. And you're going to get up to the, you know, the exile later on, where he, you know, he rejects his people, but there's always that remnant that still served the Lord. But at this point, we, we can be so sure that no matter what our failings are, no matter how great our sin is, he will not turn from us because the Lord loves to save sinners. He delights to save sinners because it brings him great glory. We say, wow, look what God can do. He can save a sinner like me. And his grace is greater than our sin. His mercy is more. And that's beautiful for us. It's encouraging. Samuel goes on to give just one further encouragement on that fact, and he, and he does so by pledging his own commitment to them. Verse 23, he says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. In Samuel, Israel has someone with them who is completely on their side, someone who will pray for them, and plead their case with the Lord, he will lead them and teach them the way they should go. And we can be glad, too, that we're not alone in our battle with sin, because the Lord speaks to us and leads us through his word, his living word. And that's why we take the Bible so seriously. It's the way the Lord points us in the right direction. And, of course, Jesus also prays for us. The Lord, God's Son, prays for us, even right now. A prayer that will always be answered, always. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2 of 1 John that I should read earlier. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, which is all of us, right? All of us. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Your sin is serious, but God's grace is greater. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your very, very great mercy. We thank you that you delight to have mercy on sinful people like us. And we thank you that even though we are so often faithless, Lord, you are faithful. Please, Father, save us from complacency over our sin. Help us to live at the foot of the cross, trusting in Christ's sacrifice for us. And lead us by your word to follow you with a growing confidence in your unchanging goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.